Good morning. morning. Welcome to Fishers of Men Lutheran Church. It's good to be here in the house of the Lord with you on this glorious day. As always, I would ask that you would remember to sign in with the handy blue folders in front of you. You can pass those down. You can sign in with the piece of paper and pen that's provided, or you can use the QR code with your phone. Uh, There's also visitor cards. If you are a visitor with us, I'd appreciate if you fill that out for us. And there's a little booklet that you can take with you. A few announcements before we get started. Remember, I told you this for a couple of weeks, but our dear friend, Dr. Lumley, the principal of Westfield House is with us today, and she will be leading Bible study, so go to Bible study. Oh, there we go. There we go. Go to Bible study. That's the main point. Go to Bible study. Coming up uh, at April 20th, Saturday, April 20th, there are a couple things going on. First of all, there's the church cleanup day. And I was not given exact hours for that, but that's usually in the morning. Scanning, anyone know hours on that? Nine, nine, nine a.m. Come and do some good, hard work to fight back the effects of sin and beautify our campus. (laughs) You think I'm joking, but uh, it's true. Weeds, right? Thorns and thistles, that's the effects of sin. Fight back the curse. So do some good, good work help out our facilities team. Uh, And then also that afternoon, we have this anti-bullying seminar that's going on that is for uh, kids ages 8 to 15. Now, I've been told if there aren't enough kids to sign up, it will have to be canceled, unfortunately. But I encourage you to get kids, grandkids, have them tell their friends, sign up for this, because this sounds like it will be absolutely fantastic. Uh, There's a lot of sin in this world. And to equip our kids to deal with that is a great opportunity. So I encourage you to sign up for that. Let Ashley know and plan to sign up for for the anti-bullying self-defense seminar. Also, uh, I haven't mentioned this in a while, but if you have your name tags, don't forget to wear your your name tags. Uh, That's helpful for visitors, and it's also just a good habit to have. So I see a lot of you are wearing them. Great. I appreciate that. And if you're not wearing it, it's okay. There's no shame. Just, you know, if you need one, let's, let Susan know. Let Susan know if you need a name badge. And last but not least, uh, the ladies, the Lady Fishers, have a couple of events coming up. So their retreat is coming up April 19th and 20th, and you can get more information and sign up for that out in the gathering area. They also have an uh, 80 Players matinee that they are going to go see together in May, May 4th, Driving Miss Daisy. So uh, more information out in the gathering area for that. With that, would you please stand as we begin our service with our opening hymn?
In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. If we say we have no sin, then we deceive ourselves, and the truth is not in us. But if we confess our sins, God, who is faithful and just, will forgive our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Let us then confess our sins to God our Father. Most merciful God, we confess that we are by nature sinful and unclean. We have sinned against you in thought, word, and deed by what we have done and by what we have left undone. We have not loved you with our whole heart. We have not loved our neighbors as ourselves. We justly deserve your presence and eternal punishment. For the sake of your Son, Jesus Christ, have mercy on us, forgive us, renew us, and lead us, so that we may delight in your will and walk in your ways to the glory of your holy name. Amen. Dear brothers and sisters, hear then the good news of our Lord, that Almighty God in his mercy has sent his Son to die for you, and for his sake he forgives you all your sins. So is a called and ordained servant of Jesus Christ, standing here in his stead with both and only his command and his authority, I forgive you all your sins. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. In peace, let us pray to the Lord. For the peace from above and for our salvation, let us pray to the Lord. For the peace of the whole world, for the well-being of the church of God, and for the unity of all, let us pray to the Lord. For this holy house and for all who offer here their worship and praise, let us pray to the Lord. Help, save, comfort, and defend us, gracious Lord.
Lord be with you. Let us pray together. Almighty God, grant that we who have celebrated the Lord's resurrection may by your grace confess in our life and conversation that Jesus is Lord and God. Through the same Jesus Christ, your Son, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. Please be seated. The first reading from this, the second Sunday of Easter, is from the fourth chapter of Acts. Now the full number of those who believed were of one heart and soul. And no one said that any of the things that belonged to him was his own, but they had everything in common. And with great power, the apostles were giving their testimony to the resurrection of the Lord Jesus, and great grace was upon them all. There was not a needy person among them, for as many as were owners of lands or houses sold them and brought the proceeds of what was sold and laid it at the apostles' feet, and it was distributed to each as any had need. This is the word of the Lord. Second reading for today is from the first and second chapters of 1 John. That which was from the beginning, which we have heard, which we have seen with our eyes, which we looked upon and have touched with our hands concerning the word of life, the life was made manifest, and we have seen it and testify to it and proclaim to you the eternal life, which was with the Father and was made manifest to us. That which we have seen and heard we proclaim also to you, so that you too may have fellowship with us. And indeed, our fellowship is with the Father and with His Son, Jesus Christ. And we are writing these things so that our joy may be complete. This is the message we have heard from Him and proclaim to you, that God is light, and in Him is no darkness at all. If we say we have fellowship with Him while we walk in darkness, we lie and do not practice the truth. But if we walk in the light as He is in the light, we have fellowship with one another. And the blood of Jesus His Son cleanses us from all sin. If we say we have no sin, we deceive ourselves and the truth is not in us. If we confess our sins, He is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. If we say we have not sinned, we make Him a liar, and His word is not in us. My little children, I am writing these things to you so that you may not sin. But if anyone does sin, we have an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ, the righteous, he is the propitiation for our sins, and not for ours only, but also for the sins of the whole world. This is the word of the Lord. Be to God. Please stand. According to St. John, the 20th chapter. Glory to you, o Lord. On the evening of that day, the first day of the week, the doors being locked where the disciples were for fear of the Jews, Jesus came and stood among them and said to them, Peace be with you. When he had said this, he showed them his hands and his side. Then the disciples were glad when they saw the Lord. Jesus said to them again, Peace be with you. As the Father has sent me, even so I am sending you. When he had said this, he breathed on them and said to them, Receive the Holy Spirit. If you forgive the sins of any, they are forgiven them. If you withhold forgiveness from any, it is withheld. Now, Thomas one of the twelve, called the twin, was not with them when Jesus came. So the other disciples told him, we have seen the Lord. 
But he said to them, unless I see with in his hands the mark of the nails and place my finger into the mark of the nails and place my hand into his side, I will never believe. Eight days later, his disciples were inside again, and Thomas was with them. Although the doors were locked, Jesus came and stood among them and said, peace be with you. Then he said to Thomas, put your finger here and see my hands and put out your hand and place it in my side. Do not disbelieve, but believe. Thomas answered him, my Lord and my God. Jesus said to him, have you believed because you have seen me? Blessed are those who have not seen and yet have believed. Now, Jesus did many other signs in the presence of the disciples, which are not written in this book, but these are written so that you may believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, and that by believing you may have life in His name. This is the gospel of the Lord. Praise to you, O Christ. You may be seated. I invite the children for it, for the children's message. We're going to go to the cross today. All right, come on up. Yeah. All right, have a seat. All right, good morning, boys and girls. Good to see you all today. How are you all doing? Good. All right, glad to hear it. Okay. So, we're at the cross again, and we're talking about symbols and images. Oh, no! Our flowers are gone. People took them. That's okay, but we talked about that last week, Easter lilies. And now we have another symbol that we mentioned last week. You guys know what these are? Butterflies. Butterflies. Yeah, and they're not here by chance. There's a real important reason why butterflies or a symbol or an image of the resurrection. Yeah. Is it peace? What? Is it peace? Peace. Uh, not quite. Not quite. Do you know what do butterflies look like before they're butterflies? Oh, caterpillars. Caterpillars. Yeah, they're caterpillars, they're like little worms, right? And maybe you read the Very Hungry Caterpillar book when you were little. Your mommy and daddy read that for you. Yeah, and you remember the caterpillar ate a whole bunch, and then he made a little cocoon. And then, he turned into a and then he came out and turned into a beautiful butterfly. Well, you know, our Lord is kind of like that too. So, you know, the prophet Isaiah said about Jesus that he had no form or majesty that we should look at him, no beauty that we should admire him. He's kind of like a caterpillar. People didn't think he was that impressive and they crucified him on the cross, and he died, and they placed him in the tomb. The tomb is kind of like uh, the caterpillar's cocoon. It's kind of like a cocoon. And Jesus rose from the dead on the third day, and he came out, and he had new life, eternal life, and it's beautiful and glorious, just like butterflies. So, when we see butterflies flying around, they remind us of the resurrection, both of Jesus' resurrection and because you are joined with Jesus in your baptism and in faith, you too will have eternal life like that. So, when you see the butterfly, remember, Jesus is risen. He's risen indeed. Alleluia. And you too will rise to eternal life, a beautiful, glorious life like the butterfly. Okay, so can you fold your hands and bow your heads and we pray? Dear Jesus, Jesus, you live forever forever. and you saved us us. to live with you you. forever too. too. Thank you, Lord, Lord. for saving us us. and help us us. to tell others others. about about your love. We love you, Lord. Lord. Amen. Amen. All right. Thank you, boys and girls. You can go back to your seats now.
Grace, mercy, and peace are yours, dear brothers and sisters, from God our Heavenly Father, through Christ Jesus our Lord. Amen. Christ is risen. He is risen indeed. Alleluia. Yes, indeed, our Lord has been raised from death into life eternal, never to die again. But this is a lot to take in. Now, I like to say uh, often that the disciples didn't get it, meaning that they didn't really get, they didn't understand Christ's mission to die and rise again until after the resurrection. If you look at John 20, even after seeing the empty tomb on Easter morning, they still didn't get it. St. John writes that Peter and the other disciple, usually understood to be John himself, they went to the tomb, they saw it, and then, as yet, they did not understand the Scripture that he must rise from the dead. So, they went home. Okay. Well, now, inevitably, someone is going to come to me after service, so I'm going to nip this in the bud. Someone's going to look right before that. That was John chapter 20, verse 9, and verse 8 says this, the other disciple, John, who had reached the tomb first, also went in, and he saw and believed. Ah, see, John believed. See, see, uh, not so fast, my friend. What did he believe? Now, if you look at it in context, it'll be quite clear that what John believed in this statement was not the resurrection. No, indeed, what he believed was Mary Magdalene's report that someone had stolen the body of Jesus from the tomb. See, they were all still expecting a dead Jesus instead of a risen Christ. And so, Jesus Himself has to intervene. He has to come to them and show Himself. He had to get in the way because the disciples just weren't getting it. They hadn't put all of His words together. They didn't recognize that He had overcome the world, as Jesus had said earlier in John. And so, they didn't have peace, just as Jesus said that they should have. And that's what we hear in our gospel reading this morning. Jesus appears to them in the locked room, the risen Christ defies the defenses of the fearing disciples, and He comes to them, putting their fears to rest with a word of peace. He identifies Himself with the marks of His crucifixion, His wounds, His hands, and His side, so that they would know that this was the same Jesus that had walked with them, that had taught them, that had healed right in front of their eyes, who had done many great signs in their sight. He remains the crucified one, even while He is now forever the risen one. There is a continuity. It's the same Jesus, and so they are glad to see the Lord, even if they don't really get it just yet. And that brings us to Thomas. Now, this text, despite the common phrase, doubting Thomas, is not really the case. Thomas was not doubting. He was unbelieving. Thomas was resisting faith. He would not take the testimony of eyewitnesses. We have seen the Lord. Oh, no, no, no. I must see it. He demanded sight before belief. And if you were here on Good Friday, you might remember that this was the same problem with the chief priests as they stood at the foot of the cross and mocked Jesus. Let Him come down, let us see, and then we will believe. And we noted how we often fall into that trap as well. But Jesus is gracious. He puts up with a whole lot with you and with me, and yes, even with Thomas. And so, we have here an artistic depiction of this encounter of Jesus showing Himself to Thomas. This is 
Caravaggio's The Incredulity of Thomas. Now that's, mind you, incredulity is not a word we use a lot, but if you were to look it up, you would see that it's a willful resistance to faith, an inability or a unwillingness to believe this is Thomas's problem. But Jesus comes to Thomas, and He doesn't just show Himself, He accommodates Thomas's demands. He not only holds out His hands and shows His side, Jesus tells Thomas to put His finger in there. Now, I imagine that Thomas, upon being given this invitation, is a bit hesitant to take Jesus up on this invitation. What once had been show and tell to the others has now been added touch, and he may not be so comfortable. Now, St. John doesn't record whether Thomas actually did touch him or not. He just goes straight from Jesus' words to Thomas' confession. But in this painting, we see that Jesus even grabs Thomas's wrist, and he makes him touch it. You wanted to put your fingers here, you put your fingers here, Thomas. Don't disbelieve, but believe. And from the look on Thomas's face, I know the, the lighting's not great, but I think you can see the wrinkles on Thomas's forehead. From the look on his face, I think it's safe to say that Thomas is a bit disturbed. See, having his finger thrust into the side of Jesus disrupts Thomas's pattern of disbelief, his resistance to faith. It can't help but be interrupted. It's the compassionate willingness of Jesus to meet Thomas where he was without leaving him where he was that breaks him out of this resistance to faith. But of course, this is not new. The Lord had been doing this way before Jesus shows up for Thomas. Here's just one example. Let's look to the Old Testament. You remember Gideon, right, from the book of Judges? And you remember how God called Gideon to be a judge to defeat the Midianites, to the people of Israel from the oppressive control of the Midianites, these foreign invaders. And as God is calling Gideon, Gideon comes up with some tests for the Lord to make sure that he's serious about this, to make sure that he can trust this God, this Yahweh who has called him to do this important but daunting work. So, Gideon comes up with this test. Here's this fleece, this thing of wool, and he tells him, okay, I'm going to put the fleece on the ground, and I want the fleece to have a bunch of dew on it, but the ground will be completely dry. Now, it's something that clearly God would have to intervene to do, and God is gracious, and He accommodates him, and He does it, and that should be enough, but Gideon says, hold on, just one more time, let's reverse things. Let's have the, the fleece be dry while the ground is all wet with dew. And God does it. He does it for him. He doesn't get mad. He doesn't rebuke Gideon. No, he is gracious and accommodates his request so that Gideon could see that the Lord is capable, so that Gideon would trust the Lord for the important work that he has set before him. And that's how the Lord operates with you and me today, my friends. Whether you've been in the church your whole life or you are brand new to this whole thing, Jesus meets you where you are because He wants to be known by you. And you can't work your way up to Him. Don't fool yourself, my friends. Don't think that you've got it all figured out or you've made it. No. Jesus comes to you. He condescends to you through His Word, through His sacraments. 
so that you would know Him, so that you would trust Him, that you would know that He is gracious and merciful, abounding in steadfast love, so that you would know His salvation. But knowing Jesus, it changes you. Like Thomas, you cannot remain indifferent. There are a lot of people, like Thomas, who will set up barriers to faith, who will say, unless I see, I will never believe. Because there are life-changing implications to believing in Jesus, to putting your faith in Him, to following Him, to trusting Him with your whole life, even with your whole eternity. You might have to give up some closely held sin, or you might have to forgive someone who has sinned against you grievously. You might have to give up a career. You might even lose important relationships because people turn your back on you. But you endure all of this, my friends, because believing Jesus, trusting Him, what we call faith, that is what brings life. And Jesus comes and gives you this faith. He comes and strengthens your faith. Now, with Thomas and the other apostles, He came and appeared in the flesh in a unique way. But with you and me, He comes with His body and blood, hidden under bread and wine. But it's still the same Jesus. It's still the crucified one. It's still the risen one. He comes to you by His Spirit, through His Word, and He comes and He says, do not disbelieve, but believe so that you would live. And my friends, you won't always get it. You'll have your questions. You'll even have doubts. And there's a field of study called apologetics, the defense of the faith. It's a a really helpful field, and Stephanie did a series of lessons for the ladies' midweek Bible study, and we're hoping that we'll recreate that for our Sunday Bible study because it's a, a great tool, a great resource for you to answer the questions that you have to strengthen you, to prepare you for your witness to others. But whether or not you get it regarding all those big or little questions of the faith, Jesus still comes to you graciously so that you would know Him, so that you would trust Him, so that you would put your faith in Him, so that you would live. He alone overcomes unbelief. And because He has given you faith, my friends, you are blessed, even though you haven't seen Him as Thomas and the others saw Him. But because you have this faith, because you have seen Him with faith rather than your eyes, you confess with Thomas, this is my Lord and my God, and you confess day after day that Christ is risen. He is risen indeed. Alleluia. Amen. Would you please stand as you're able? Having heard God's Word, we respond in trust and hope as we confess our common faith together with the whole church throughout time and space with the words of the Nicene Creed. I believe in one God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and of all things visible and invisible and in one Lord Jesus Christ, the only begotten Son of God, begotten of His Father before all worlds, God of God, light of light, very God of very God, begotten, not made, being of one substance with the Father, by whom all things were made, who for us men and for our salvation came down from heaven 
and was incarnate by the Holy Spirit of the Virgin Mary and was made man and was crucified also for us under Pontius Pilate. He suffered and was buried and the third day rose again according to the scriptures and ascended into heaven and sits at the right hand of the Father. And he will come again with glory to judge both the living and the dead whose kingdom will have no end. And I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Lord and giver of life, who proceeds from the Father and the Son, who with the Father and the Son together is worshiped and glorified, who spoke by the prophets. And I believe in one holy Christian and apostolic church. I acknowledge one baptism for the remission of sins, and I look for the resurrection of the dead and the life of the world to come. Amen. You may be seated. We take time now to gather our tithes and our offerings. We also receive a musical interlude from the choir while I prepare the table. We pray together. Thank you, Lord, for blessing us so that we may be a blessing to others. Amen. Would you please remain standing as you're able for the prayers of the church. Let us pray for the whole people of God in Christ Jesus and for all people according to their needs. Heavenly Father, your Son is the firstborn from the dead. In Him we have been reborn into a new life and living hope. Nurture us with the pure milk of Your Word that we may grow to maturity of faith and have everlasting life. Lord, in Your mercy. Your people are united in the common life and love of our Savior. Grant that we would share that life and love with those in need. Build up the households of Your people that your holy children, begotten in baptism, may grow in your grace and share together in your forgiveness and life. Lord, in your mercy. You have instituted authorities to carry out your justice. Bless all who make, administer, and judge the laws of our land. Give them wisdom, integrity, and honor to serve according to your good will. Lord, in your mercy. Father, we praise you and we give you thanks for every blessing. This week, we especially thank you for those celebrating wedding anniversaries, Tom and Donna Pugh, Brett and Kim Keast, and Greg and Amanda Brock. Lord, we thank you for the baptism of Emily Grace Anciso into your family last Sunday. 
Lord, we thank you for those who helped with the worship services and for Pastor Ridley's wonderful messages of anticipation and hope during the Lenten season and on Easter celebration. And Lord, we thank you for prayers answered and for God's peace during difficult times. Lord, in your mercy. O oh Lord, your steadfast love in Christ is good. Turn your abundant mercy towards all who suffer in our midst. Grant Gloria Askren quick healing following her procedure. Grant Jennifer Washman continued healing and peace to her parents. Grant Nancy Girding healing from her breathing issues. Lord, grant Ron Cole success as he begins cancer treatments. Grant healing to those who are suffering with pain issues and your peace as they wait on test results. Grant travel safety to Deb Luna and grant Terry Hemphill your grace as he deals with medical issues. Lord, grant Lauren Donna Thomas's niece healing from postpartum preeclampsia. Lord, in your mercy. Lord, you are the Alpha and the Omega, the resurrection and the life. and You alone give eternal life. Grant hope, peace, and comfort to the family and friends of Robert Brown, especially his wife, Carol. And Lord, grant your peace and comfort to the family and friends of Garrett Isaacson, especially his wife, Gwen, and daughter, Soli. Lord, in your mercy. Into your hands we commend all for whom we pray, trusting in your mercy, through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. As our Lord's last will and testament, we take him at his word when he says that this is my body, this is my blood. So we recognize that the elements of bread and wine are neither changed nor do they merely represent in this gift, this supper that our Lord has left us. But by his power and his promise, Jesus is truly bodily present for you and me to eat and to drink. It's a mystery to be received in faith, not something to be explained away by reason. We also take St. Paul seriously when he says that we are to examine ourselves before eating and drinking, because if we do so without discerning the body of Christ, we eat and drink judgment on ourselves. So the church has long recognized three characteristics of those who would partake of this meal. First, that they be part of the holy Christian church through holy baptism. Second, that they be able to examine themselves, usually including some course of instruction to know what this meal is, what its benefits are, why we're receiving it, and that we be repentant of our sin. And thirdly, that we be united in our confession of faith. So if this describes you, I warmly welcome you. I urge you to come forward to receive the gifts that Christ has won for you on the cross, forgiveness and with it life and salvation. If this does not describe you, I welcome you forward for a blessing from our Lord. I simply ask that you would cross your arms over your chest like this to indicate so. So dear friends, the Lord be with you. Lift up your hearts. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is truly good, right, and salutary that we should at all times and in all places give thanks to you. Holy Lord, Almighty Father, everlasting God, and most especially are we bound to praise you on this day for the glorious resurrection of your Son, Jesus Christ, the very Paschal Lamb, who was sacrificed for us and bore the sins of the world. By his dying, he has destroyed death, and by his rising again, he has restored to us everlasting life. Therefore, with Mary Magdalene, Peter and John, and with all the witnesses of the resurrection, with angels and archangels, and with all the company of heaven, we laud and magnify your glorious name, evermore praising you and saying, Holy, Holy, Holy Lord, God of are you, Lord of heaven and earth, for you have had mercy on those whom you created, and sent your only begotten Son into our flesh to bear our sin and to be our Savior. With repentant joy, we receive the salvation accomplished for us by the all-availing sacrifice of His body and His blood on the cross.
Gathered in the name and the remembrance of Jesus, we beg you, O Lord, to forgive, renew, and strengthen us with your word and spirit. Grant us faithfully to eat his body and drink his blood as he bids us do in his own testament. Gather us together, we pray, from the ends of the earth to celebrate with all the faithful the marriage feast of the Lamb in his kingdom, which has no end. Graciously receive our prayers, deliver and preserve us. To you alone, O Father, be all glory, honor, and worship with the Son and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. Lord, remember us in your kingdom and teach us to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. Our Lord Jesus Christ, on the night when he was betrayed, took bread. And when he had given thanks, he broke it and gave it to his disciples and said, Take, eat, this is my body, which is given for you. This do in remembrance of me. In the same way, also after supper, he took the cup. And when he had given thanks, he gave it to them, saying, Drink of it, all of you. This cup is the New Testament in my blood, which is shed for you for the forgiveness of sins. This do as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. The peace of the Lord be with you always. Amen.
Let us pray. We give thanks to you, Almighty God, that you have refreshed us through this salutary gift. And we implore you that of your mercy, you would strengthen us through the same in faith toward you and in fervent love toward one another. Through Jesus Christ, your Son, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you in the Holy Spirit, you are one God, now and forever. Amen. Go now in the name and with the blessing of our Lord. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine on you and be gracious to you. The Lord look upon you with favor and give you his peace now and forevermore. Amen. Go in peace, serve the Lord. Thanks Thanks be be to God, God. for Christ is risen. He He is is risen risen indeed. indeed. Alleluia.